Welcome everyone. This is the EBC's quarterly membership meeting for December and we're excited that everyone has joined. Um, just really quick, I'm gonna run over the format for you. Um, I'll be moderating today and typically we have a uh, Zoom meeting. This is designed to still be a meeting, not a formal webinar. However, we're using the webinar format so that we're able to put the speakers up on the screen at the times um, that we have them presenting. And uh, please, uh, you are hidden and muted um, throughout the whole uh, meeting. And if you have questions or need, uh, want to make comments, um, please put those into the chat box. Ian Deborah will be managing that and bringing questions forward, especially during the panel's discussion and after um, our policy action committee um, presentation and update. And um, Connie is managing uh, our participants, Connie Newber, who is our membership and marketing manager, will be um, managing the technology on the call. And um, with that, um, let's get started. I am going to move some things around here. So uh, also, uh, as we're getting started, you may have noticed in the chat box, uh, there's a couple instructions, but there's also a URL um, address for our EBC members to uh, take a quick survey. It's four questions. Um, we had a survey a year and a half ago with our membership. And uh, one of the top things that came up that we asked, how can we help your business in 2020? And it said, get the younger generation into our business. And so we wanted to ask that question and ask you about the topics that you'd like to hear about next year. So if you would take a couple minutes to take that either now while we're getting started or afterwards, that would be wonderful. And we'll share the results with um, all of our members. Um, <clears throat> with that, I am going to I'm adjusting here my participants. Um, so we're excited. Um, our agenda today, if you'll take a look at the slide that we have. Um, first, we're going to uh, have Carmen Best um, from Recurve. She's our PAC, which is our Policy Action Committee Chair, uh, and just want to recognize her and say thank you for all of her work for the past nine months on our DSM uh, work with Excel and through the PUC process. And we'll have Casey Canello, who's going to present the update on Excel Energy's 2021-2022 DSM plan and the settlement process um, that EBC's memberships participated in. And also Mark Detsky will be available for questions and answers. Um, following that, Howard Geller from SWEEP is going to give us a quick uh, window into the legislative session starting 2021 and three of the bills that are coming that you might be interested in getting involved with. All of this will be discussed on January 7th at our Policy Action Committee and definitely get involved. Um, we have a lot going on in our industry that you can have influence and in, um, EBC you know, is, our goal is to be able to advocate and help you have influence and a voice at the table in making that change that um, will make a difference for your business. Basically the EBC, we create a bigger piece of pie for the whole industry, that's our ultimate goal. Um, after that, we'll start with the panel discussion, talking about what's trending in 2021. And we're specifically looking at the future of energy efficiency and the emerging trends of beneficial electrification, where it fits, and what that means to, the, um, to our industries, contractors, distributors, all the companies on the front lines um, who are installing these types of equipment and how our businesses are going to change in the next decade. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started 
with the policy action committee update. And I believe that there is a PowerPoint and Casey Canelo and Dietz and Mark Detsky from Dietz and Davis are the EBC's legal counsel. And um, they are guiding our members and us through the process this year and uh, look forward to hearing uh, how uh, all the results. Patricia, before we hand it over to Casey, I was just going to say a big thank you to all the members that engaged in the process this year. Um, we had hundreds of pages of DSM plan to review. Um, it was an exceptional document because there were lots of forward looking proposals in it. There were new technologies, there were new concepts around um, beneficial electrification and um, demand response and even electric vehicles. Uh, so I just wanted to say a big thank you to all the members who engaged in that. Um, we met as a pack a few times in preparation for those comments and you know everyone heard us cheerleading for come to the pack meetings, etc. Um, and folks did. We developed multiple drafts uh, like review documents to share perspectives and um, ideas about improvements to, for Excel and uh, compiled them on behalf of the membership and submitted them back to Excel. And we got lots of great feedback and wonderful conversations with Excel. And we felt really good about being able to move the industry forward. And I'm gonna hand it off to Casey from there or Mark, whoever's gonna take the baton um, to talk about what actually came out of it. Thanks, Carmen. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Canelio, and I'm with the law firm Deeds and Davis. And I, along with EEBC counsel Mark Detsky, have been involved in the Excel Energy 2021 2022 Demand Side Management or DSM plan at the Public Utilities Commission on behalf of EEBC. And I'll be giving a brief overview of EEBC's involvement in this proceeding and the settlement that EEBC joined last month that is currently under review for approval at the commission. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so on July 1st of this year, a little bit of background, Excel filed its verified application requesting approval of its electric and natural gas uh, demand side management plan for the calendar years 2021 and 2022. And this filing uh, represents increases across the board for the plan's goals compared to the levels approved in the last DSM plan um, that EBC was also involved in. Uh, the plan's proposed electric budget was originally 89.9 million for 2021 and 90.1 million for 2022. And then for the gas side budgets, Excel proposed a budget of 17.8 million for 2021 and 18.1 million for 2022. And EBC moved to intervene into this case to offer an industry perspective and was one of 13 total intervening parties in the proceeding along with interveners such as SWEEP and Energy Outreach Colorado. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so after the company filed its proposed plan and supporting direct testimony this summer, a procedural schedule was set in the case for answer testimony, rebuttal testimony, and an evidentiary hearing before an administrative law judge at the PUC. And the parties in this case, including EBC, engaged in settlement discussions starting in September. And EBC provided its first settlement proposal to Excel in early October and also received and reviewed settlement proposals from the other parties. And settlement discussions continued through October and November. And a majority of the intervening parties filed answer testimony based on their proposals in early November. Next slide, please. And as part of um, EBC's initial settlement proposal, um, we offered a large number of measure proposals. Um, this is only about half of them. And from a, from a variety of different EBC members covering areas of demand response, beneficial electrification, commercial, HVAC, residential HVAC, and small business. And these proposals um, included um, 
proposals for rebates, education and training recommendations, along with technical suggestions. Next slide, please. Uh, and in the settlement process that involved all parties, so EBC in total submitted 14 different product proposals and or measures to be included in this 2021 to 2022 DSM plan. And EBC also presented two different pilot proposals for consideration, so for a total of 16 different uh, proposals in this um, proceeding. And EBC met individually with many of the parties in between the larger settlement discussions and met one-on-one -on -one with Excel, the Energy Office, the Office of Consumer Council, Western Resource Advocates, the cities of Denver and Boulder in order to garner support for its 16 different proposals. And a number of EEBC's proposals were similar to or aligned with the settlement positions of many of the other intervening parties, which helped with moving our settlement proposals forward with the company. Next slide, please. So the parties were able to come to a settlement agreement late last month that EBC joined, and um, it was joined by every party in the proceeding except for the Colorado energy consumers who did not oppose the settlement. So it was an un unopposed settlement agreement, and it memorialized the resolution of issues related to 20 discrete topics, ranging from overall program budgets and general principles to specific offerings in the plan. And um, for an example, Excel has agreed to increase the budget for his residential demand response products to drive high, higher participation and savings compared to its originally filed plan. And under the settlement agreement, the company will also have modest natural gas budget increases in each year. And for the income qualified program, Excel will offer stronger incentives for building shell measures such as air sealing, attic insulation, crawl space insulation, storm windows, and wall insulation. And in the area of beneficial electrification, Excel will dedicate $1 million of the plan's annual budget to various BE offerings to evaluate the expansion of current commercial heat pump offerings, offer cold climate heat pumps with tiered incentives, offer trade partner dis distributor incentives for heat pump installations and offer substantial market transformation and workforce training activities that will help EBC members in transitioning with the energy efficiency market. And Excel has also agreed to increase rebates for heat pumps under its residential HVAC product while reducing rebates for standard air conditioner with QI measures. Um, so that's just a few examples of, of how EBC was able to come to come to this proceeding and, and move move the needle a little bit compared to the plan that was filed in July. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so based on the settlement uh, earlier this month on December 7th, the ALJ granted the party's request to vacate the remaining procedural schedule and set a one day settlement hearing to take place next month on January 21st. And the ALJ also required testimony to be filed in support of the settlement agreement and that occurred earlier this week. And so in terms of next steps, the ALJ will review the testimony that's filed by all the parties and review the settlement agreement and decide whether the Excel's plan um, as amended, as modified by the terms of the settlement agreement is in the public interest just and reasonable. And we expect the plan will be approved by the commission in early 2021 and following the approval, Excel uh, will need to work to implement the plan before it is officially launched. And so as part of the settlement agreement, Excel's current plan, the 2019 to 2020 DSM plan, will remain in place and continue until the new plan um, is approved and implemented by the company. Next slide, please. Um, so overall, this was a very successful proceeding for EBC and its members, and we look forward to tracking the continued progress um, of this new DSM plan upon its approval. And please let um, us know if anyone has any questions on EBC's involvement in the settlement process and its proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Um, Mark, did you want to make any additional comments? And also, if there are questions, um, we could take a couple if we want, and if anyone would like to put a question in the chat box. Yes, hi, everybody. Um, my internet has been wacky this morning, so 
apologies if you can't hear me, just raise your hand or something if I'm not coming through. Um, but thanks, Casey, for that summary. I just want to add that um, this plan is, is about the largest we've seen from Excel in terms of electric savings um, and gas savings, and they're going above that. And they're up to nearly 600 gigawatt hours of savings um, in 2021, in the 2021 plan based on this. And, they're, and they have a certain amount of cap that the commission set for their budget of like, it's like 93 million. And that was to include um, the, the, a base budget of 78 million and then they could go bigger. And what this plan does is it starts off um, uh, from the get-go at, at 90 million plus. And so that represents, you know, typically we've seen in the past um, that about 50 to 60% of that budget ends up being direct rebates. And so that's what's really important for EBC members um, to look at. And then we have this big beneficial electrification push that really gets going in this plan for the first time. And EEBC has positioned ourselves to be um, critical in that process because uh, it doesn't happen without buy-in from the contractor community and, and without um, distributors stocking the equipment um, and contractors selling the equipment. And so we think that uh, basically we are the linchpin in whether or not that transition is successful. Um, and so this was also a, a, a lot of proposals from EEBC and we got movement from the company on nearly every proposal that we submitted. So a really good victory and really strong effort by Carmen and Patricia um, uh, to get this done. So thank you guys. There's also some, uh, some questions going back and forth here. I'll just read them out so everyone can see it or hear it. <clears throat> so it, uh, Sean from Owens Courting asked, what does the partial column in the charts represent? And then Carmen uh, responded uh, saying partial means that we got a portion of the request. It depends on which one. We can provide the specific difference for each one in an email follow-up. And I believe Patricia, we have a, like a, a call specifically for the policy committee um, in early 2021 where we'll, we'll, we'll get under the hood on uh, the settlement on these proposals. Uh, but this is a bit high level, plus we have other parties to the case on the call, so we can't get <clears throat> um, too much into the details here. Absolutely, and right now we have that tentative date set for January 7th and looking um, either at two or three o'clock. So um, put that on your calendar. We'll be sending out after this meeting, we'll send out the meeting no notice um, to the entire PAC committee and also probably to the whole membership, you know, reminding people that this is PAC committee is where the action's at. So um, definitely that's where you find out the most and have the opportunity to get involved and put in the most input. Um, and also, can I add there that this PAC committee, we got started in this PAC committee, what, in April? Yes. Or May? Um, so this this committee of companies that have been working on this, have been working on their proposals for uh, six months at least um, to get it to the place where we are today. And, and the proposals um, take a lot of work between us and the companies and then the companies in Excel and several calls and Excel expressed to us on more than one occasion how much they appreciate the sophistication of the proposals that we're bringing right now. So um, I think that's a compliment to all the members uh, and all of the participants in the policy committee who um, uh, bring their proposals forward. Absolutely. And it does. And that's, I think, the thing that's so important to be involved with the PAC committee, because as Mark said, once the settlement starts, it's too late. <laughs> you need to be, as a company, figuring out your positioning, you know, what, what is going to go into that. We're working out numbers and details and helping coach and what you're putting in there. Um, it just makes the lift a lot easier when everyone's involved and gives more time for more collaboration between members to find out where there's some synergies to, you know, work together on, you know, different 
requests and proposals. So that's a great point. Mark. Well, I, I just want to add that the work is not done, right? A lot of these proposals, a lot of these proposals, I mean, Casey went over the stuff we're meeting in the docket um, for the lawyers, but also um, for the organization, a lot of these commitments that we got in the settlement are commitments to work with EEBC or to work with other settling parties. Yeah. And so um, it's up to us to make sure that there's follow through on yeah. the elements that are in the proposal. So, and that, that takes a lot of work in 2021. Yeah, so then as the individual company proposals and you see all, all the yeses next to them, now that's where the work of implementing, designing and what that's gonna be and how it's your company is gonna support it in the marketplace and, and work with Excel, that's all still pending to actually implement what was accepted. Patricia, could I have one last thing? And then we'll, I know we need to move on to the agenda, but I just, you know, call out for the pack in the upcoming year. I think a lot of the work that we did this time around with the Excel DSM plan sets a good foundation for engagement that we could have in other parts of the state as well, um, because we were able to find some of those sweet spots on rebates and other ideas. So um, that's one thing we want to work up, work through in January too, is where we can um, be effective engaging with other um, utilities and, and service providers in the state. Um, and there's also going to be some legislative things coming up next year too. So please get engaged. And if anyone's um, interested in taking a bigger role, uh, let us know because it's a lot of work. <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, and our agenda is designed to help uh, the frontline, the contractors, the distributors um, to take forward and understand how all of these new concepts and the things that were presented in the DSM plan, um, what it means to the market and what market development is gonna be necessary to um, make the goals a reality from all the organizations that we're gonna hear about here at the, with the panelists. So um, any other comments or questions before we move on in the agenda? Great, fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Um, the PAC committee is a lot of work and it's really exciting work. So, um, and makes a difference in our businesses. So get involved, absolutely get engaged. Um, next, Howard Geller from Sweep is gonna give us a, um, a quick highlight of what is going to probably be presented and what the legislative session is going to look like in 2021, since in 2020, um, it pretty much spent the entire session talking about um, COVID and the pandemic. So um, hopefully we have a brighter session in January. Welcome, Howard, thank you. Uh, hi, folks. Um, morning. Hope you can hear me okay. Yep. Patricia's nodding, so that's good. Good to be with you here. And uh, uh, yes, I was listening in on the most of the last session and indeed uh, the DSM plan docket that was being discussed was a, was a great step forward. Sweep was also very engaged and spearheaded some of these modifications that we got to the plan as it was filed. And we greatly appreciated the partnership with EEBC and other interveners. It was a great work together as, as usual. And we also agree it's a, a good outcome and a, and a step forward. So um, I'm gonna talk about three legislative proposals that are shaping up for the upcoming legislative session that starts in mid-January. Proposals that Sweep and others have been working on for quite a while. We had started uh, <clears throat> last year, um, late last year in hopes of having these introduced in the 2020 session, but the session, of course, was shortened and bills were not uh, introduced in 2020, but we're optimistic they'll, they will get introduced this year or, or in, the, in the 2021 session. And uh, 
help to move us forward. And, you know, we're, we're getting good results, if not very good results in Colorado on energy efficiency, but there's always more we can do on energy efficiency and, and beneficial electrification. Um, next slide. I think you guys are controlling the slides. Thank you. So the first bill is a bill focused on commercial buildings, and it's a bill that would take a statewide the concept of portfolio manager and energy star benchmarking, something already required in Denver, Boulder, and Fort Collins, and make it a statewide program that would apply to buildings over 50,000 square feet. Mo most buildings, there are some exemptions in the bill. Uh, the reporting starts for year 2021. The reporting would be in, uh, in 2022 by June of 22 and June every year after that. Buildings would report on their uh, portfolio manager score to CO, Colorado Energy Office. And that just as is, as is the case for Denver, there'd be an, a website that makes publicly available the scores of buildings, both the, the actual numerical score and the energy use intensity, EUI factor for the buildings. And the bill doesn't just require uh, benchmarking and reporting. Uh, the bill also has some performance requirements and potentially upgrade requirements for buildings that are not well performing. The concept is every five years starting in 2026, there would be some compliance requirements. The first round of requirements <clears throat> are hardwired in the bill. And after that, the requirements will be set by the uh, organization, the state entity that has the ability to, to undertake rulemakings, the Air Quality Control Commission. And um, the initial upgrade requirements would uh, have a number of pathways for compliance. Buildings that have a score of 75 or higher are good to go. Uh, buildings that start off below that level uh, need to improve either their, their benchmarking score, or reduce their energy use intensity and index the EUI value. Um, and the bill has an overall goal of, of achieving 20% energy savings and greenhouse gas emissions reductions from the, the covered commercial buildings by 2031 mm -hmm. relative to energy use and emissions for those buildings in 2021, so over 10 years. Next, please. So the second bill is a bill to further advance beneficial electrification in buildings. It's great that XL Energy is moving in this direction, filed a DSM plan that, that had some initial programs and we got those programs doubled in budget to a million dollars per year through the settlement process. Excel in, in our view is now um, not just dipping toes in the water, maybe dipping a foot or half a foot in the water here, getting started uh, through this, this DSM plan. Uh, but there's more that can and should be done in our view and in view of other organizations supporting this, this bill. And so this policy would uh, direct the uh, PUC to set some electrification targets for the regulated electric utilities, Excel and Black Hills Energy, in the same manner it sets DSM energy savings targets. Once targets are set, electric utilities will prepare and get approval for beneficial electrification program plans and then implement those plans. Uh, programs can be implemented in conjunction with energy efficiency programs, but there would be this separate tracking of expenditures, of savings, of emissions reductions, 
and uh, achievement of targets. There's also cost recovery and a potential financial incentive for the utility if it meets or exceeds targets ex established by the commission. There'd be annual reporting. And the overall goal here is robust beneficial electrification and buildings programs on the part of the electric utilities. And as a result, rapid expansion of, of uh, the beneficial electrification market. And then uh, the third proposal, next slide, please. The third policy is a fo policy focused on facilitating expansion of gas utility energy efficiency programs. Again, this is something that is that has started here in the last year or two and continues in the new DSM plan. But once again, um, more can and should be done in, the, in this area um, for XL and other regulated gas utilities in the state. So uh, this policy would direct the PUC to set natural gas savings targets for regulated gas utilities, something that is not done at the current time. The policy establishes the, the inclusion of the social cost of carbon and methane emissions, the two primary greenhouse gases, in cost effectiveness analysis of natural gas energy efficiency programs. The policy adopted in, in 2019 in Colorado establishes the use of the social cost of carbon in electric resource planning, and including uh, DSM planning for regulated electric utilities. And of course, the atmosphere doesn't distinguish between carbon coming from power plants and carbon or methane coming from the natural gas uh, production and distribution and, and combustion. So this is uh, uh, bringing into the natural gas world uh, the same concept that's already been adopted for the, the, elect the electric world. And a, a third uh, component of this, of this proposed policy is uh, directing utilities in the PUC to use a social discount rate, a relatively low discount rate for determining the net present value of economic benefits for the customer cost share uh, going towards uh, energy efficiency measures adopted through gas utility energy efficiency programs. The utility share is still uh, discounted at the same rate they've always used, but the, the customer share would be discounted at a, at a more modest uh, rate that's more appropriate for uh, customer contributions to costs, which will also help to uh, improve cost effectiveness analysis and presumably lead to more measures passing cost effectiveness screening. Um, so those are the three proposals. I probably have used all my time, but uh, I'm happy to take questions now or later. People know how to get in touch with me and you have any follow-up comments or questions, uh, <clears throat> happy to engage with you. I'm not seeing any- I think um, you're muted, Patricia. And this is the end. I'm not, yeah, I'm not seeing any questions come in. So if, if you have some questions right now, just put it in the chat. I have a question. <laughs> Howard, where will you be in 2021 and can we join you? Uh, I will be in Boulder, Colorado, for the most part. And uh, sure, you know, we'll get, I'll get vaccinated. We'll have a big party at my house, okay? Um, but I'm, uh, as Mark alluded to, Sweep is in the process of uh, securing its next executive director, my successor, and we're getting pretty close to an announcement. So Stay tuned for that. Uh, probably first week of January, there'll be an announcement about that. 
I'll continue to work for, for SWEEP for a couple more months and help with the transition. And then I'll be a part-time consultant and hopefully very part-time uh, help, helping SWEEP and possibly other entities in my semi-retirement starting uh, next spring. Well, Howard, I just want to thank you for all of your amazing contributions to industry, to EBC in particular, um, for getting the organization really going, starting it, um, and for uh, really um, being responsible in large part for all the DSM we have in Colorado today. So I just want to thank you for all your great work. Thank, thanks, Mark. Yeah, it's been great to of course, starting EBC was a group effort, and I was lucky enough to be part of that group. Paul, Paul Kreischer, I saw on this call, was another one of the, the founders. And uh, yeah, it's been great experience here working with EBC and so many others, all the great staff at Sweep. And we've, we've come a long way. And some of you may have seen the ACEEE released its annual energy efficiency, the state scorecard yesterday and Colorado moved up from 14th place last year to 11th place in 2020. So we're getting close to breaking into the top 10 and that's not easy to do because there's a lot of states Northeast states and West Coast states that have been at this a long time, and you have to kind of jump jump ahead of some states that are that are quite committed and, and strong in energy efficiency. But uh, Colorado's been uh, been moving up, and um, it's great to see. And so, yeah, back to this these policy proposals, assuming they go forward. Sweep will be asking for support from EEBC. We, we hope the organization can back these proposals, individual companies that are interested. We, we very much like your support and um, hope we could work, work together on uh, moving these towards adoption. We hope and expect support from the Colorado Energy Office. We've been working with them on developing these proposals and we hope and expect support from the governor's office as well. I think we have a good shot at, at getting them adopted. And Howard, we have a couple questions. Um, see, is there any talk in legislation to ban gas and new construction? Not in state legislation, not in a, a you know, for the state as a whole. I know some local governments are considering doing that at the local level through local building codes and uh, it's something that SWEEP would encourage and support. Um, so talk to Jim Myers and Christine Brinker about that if you wanna work on that at the, at the local level, but nothing's contemplated at the state level. Okay, and then one more. Um, if these move forward, when would these become, any of these become law? The legislative session here runs for 120 days. I think um, January um, 13th or 14th is the first day of the session. And it's a little unclear with COVID still rampant exactly how the session will play out. It's possible that the legislature could take a break and come back a uh, couple months later and, and run the session uh, uh, later this year. Um, it normally would end in May and bills get signed by the governor then typically in the kind of June and July timeframe. Um, but it, there could be some delays in, in 2021. The bills are generally structured so that Policy, the policies start in 2022. So January of 22, things would get rolling in terms of PUC proceedings, 
the, the benchmarking of, of, of buildings, um, you know, the collection of the data for 2021 and, and reporting uh, happens in 2022. So that's kind of the, the timeline. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, Patricia, do you wanna pass it, pass it back to you? Absolutely, yeah. And Howard, I just wanna echo the, all the sentiments from Mark and everyone. You've absolutely been a visionary in our industry and um, you're one of our original founders of the UBC and we look forward to doing many more things together here in the future, so thank you. Um, right. And great recap as well for um, the Policy Action Committee. Those are some of the things that we're going to dig into and talk about what our organization wants to um, do. But we are looking to support and bring that business voice from our industry to those bills. And that's how we usually participate in uh, the legislative process and partner with SWIM. So with that, um, we're moving forward to the panel discussion. And um, I'm gonna just frame this up with a couple slides to talk about uh, what the intent is and how this relates to you know, all the work the EBC has been doing. And the goal this morning in the panel is to understand how energy efficiency fits into the future beneficial electrification. Because um, there's been many comments in the field and I'll talk about those in a little bit. And um, then also all this change that's coming, you know, how does that impact your business through the end of this decade? Because this isn't going to be like the uh, 1970s when energy efficiency really got started and it took 30 years to get where we're at, um, you know, with approximately 30% of buildings in the US being energy efficient. It's coming in the next time, nine years, the goals are all lined up on 2030. So um, it's a very exciting time. Next slide, Ian, please. And um, I wanted to tell a quick story when I say it's a very exciting time because Carmen Best was talking about one of her colleagues who is getting ready to retire after 30 years. And she said, oh, are you getting excited for your retirement to start? And he said, no way, are you kidding? I'm not retiring. This is the most exciting time in the in our industry in the, since the past 30 years. And so that's a great comment for when we ready to retire. It's like, no way, I'm not doing that. This is too much fun. There's so much happening. And with that, I want to also, there's some background noise. Um, sounds like air or water or something. I don't know if you can hear that. Connie, you can mute. Anyone? Or there, is. there we go, it's gone. Thanks. Um, and which also I think is a great quote to remind the younger generations that this is the time to enter high performance building and construction industry. It's, it's almost like it's at an intersection where building science meets the intersection of energy transition and the internet of things, smart things trends. And so it's very exciting. And we're gonna talk about the trends that are driving this and what is um, what this means to our businesses and where the opportunities are and those types of things. Ian, next slide, please. And just to, uh, this is a high level um, slide and wanna thank Navigant, it's Navigant Research and Mitsubishi provided it, um, but energy efficiency growth continues. And here is a, uh, chart that shows through 2028 that um, by 2028 we're expected to have an efficiency spending of 11 billion and you can see the increase over the next um, couple of years and heat pump programs new incentives and reallocation of existing incentives is exactly what we've been talking about in the DSM plan today and um, this just validates that energy efficiency we believe isn't going anywhere um, it's still going to be an incredible part of our business. And um, the one comment that I had heard that really drove uh, this topic for our panelists is I've 
and this has been echoed by many of the panelists, that um, I had uh, actually a, distribu a distributor who actually distributed um, heat pumps had mentioned, well, I don't know if energy efficiency will be relevant now that renewables are coming online with utilities in the future. And there is a misperception or a perception that um, we want this presentation to address directly because um, EDC believes that energy efficiency is the cornerstone of when we talk about clean jobs and net zero buildings and um, talking about adding on renewables and microgrids and all the things that are happening. And um, so our job at the EDC is to help our businesses transition and find those opportunities as the market grows. Next slide, please. And so the question is, how will your businesses change? How are we gonna adapt and differentiate in this new environment? And uh, we're talking about the energy transition, energy efficiency, renewables, utility time of use rates, you know, wind and solar, and it's, it's a long list, all being driven by these concepts of beneficial electrification and decarbonization and clean energy. And it's very confusing. So we wanna demystify today is our goal. And of course, smart home uh, technical devices, the internet of things with Alexa and um, you know, smart bulbs and thermostats and fridges, uh, it's all colliding and our contractors are having to navigate installing equipment, but also having it communicate as well with all these devices. So the, the construction industry is advancing quickly and it really is building science and um, meets all the other things that are happening. So next slide, please. So our panelists today, um, I'm excited because we have a cross section of panelists that represent different areas of our industry that are influencing and also um, that are driving as well as understand all the different pressures points and all the change that's happening. And so um, what I'd like to do is have each of our panelists give a quick introduction of their background because I think we are going to be able to talk from a very high level of what is beneficial electrification. There's many definitions to based on which industry is talking about it. Then we have um, you know, what we talked about today with Excel and how that's influencing. And then also what is happening in the buildings with Paul Kreischer. And so um, if we would, to get started, Marcus, would you just do a quick introduction of uh, your role at NREL? And, um, and we'll want to keep it as brief as possible just because we want to make sure we have a lot of time for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, Marcus Bianchi, I'm a uh research engineer at NREL with the Building Energy Science Group that is part of the Building Technologies and Science Center. Um, I spend most of my time thinking about uh, energy storage, particularly thermal energy storage in buildings. Um, and I also uh, lead for the center, the business development part, which is partnerships with non-DOE uh, entities. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Brian? I'm Brian Jungers, Senior Manager at eSource on the technology research side of our customer energy solutions team. And for those who don't know, eSource used to be part of Rocky Mountain Institute about 30 plus years ago, and um, we're based in Boulder, Colorado. Great. Paul? Yeah, I'm Paul Kreischer. I uh, used, used to be owner operator of Lightly Treading for 23 years. We merged with PCD Engineering and October of 2019. Um, our focus long has been, still is, on doing lots of energy ratings, energy audits, lots of uh, energy modeling, work in the field with builders and homeowners, make their homes more energy efficient. I also recently started Heart of a Building, where we're doing inspirational educational videos in conjunction with Colorado State University to showcase the why behind highly sustainable um, regenerative buildings, uh, the why as well as the what um, with that, and happy to be a part of this panel today. Thanks, Paul. Mark, Schoenheider? 
Good morning, uh, Mark Schoenheider with Excel Energy. Uh, my team is responsible for all of our uh, demand side management programs on the, the res and small business side across all of our operating companies. Great, and Anne? I'm part of Mark's organization at Excel Energy on the residential uh, side, wearing a couple of hats. One is program management and the other is uh, trade relations. And that includes training up the, the trade partners. Great, thank you everyone for participating today. Um, our format is informal. We're going to, I'm gonna walk through questions and we're all going to um, input. And what we'd like to do is ask everyone who's on our call to submit any questions into the chat box and we will address them at the end so that we can get through um, the entire agenda. And um, with that, let's go ahead and um, move forward. And Connie, just let us know when you have us all up on the screen. You all look great. Fantastic. All right. So the first question that I wanted to touch on is just from each of your industry perspectives, would you give us your thoughts and definitions of beneficial electrification. And um, we're starting at a high level so we can kind of frame up what is this beneficial electrification we're all hearing about. And um, I thought maybe Brian, it would be great to have you kick that off from your perspective since your organization works with utilities and delivers programs in the field. Sure. Thanks, Patricia. Um, you know, we work with hundreds of utilities across the US and Canada and it does seem like everyone has a different definition. We came up with our own last year. Um, we spent several months, a group of 10 of us, um, defining and, uh, and establishing a framework for beneficial electrification. So from the e-source perspective, uh, it needs to be environmentally beneficial uh, in order to qualify. So it needs to lower carbon emissions. Um, a measure also has to be economically beneficial. It needs to help lower uh, customer bills and it needs to be grid efficient uh, in that integrating it into the grid needs to help uh, lower the rates for the entire rate base. So that's how we define beneficial electrification. And what is, when we say beneficial electrification, what actually happens? Those are the objectives. Are there programs? Is it... Um, uh, there are, they're mostly pilots right now. Um, and no program that I'm aware of has actually been evaluated yet. So it's 2BD on how well different methodologies are working out. But um, on the East Coast, we see in Massachusetts, they're kind of just rolling in beneficial electrification into existing uh, resource plans. Uh, on the West Coast, it's um, maybe a little more tactical, adding you know, two-prong uh, BE tests to their existing uh, cost effectiveness testing to ensure that uh, fuel switching is actually um, overall beneficial electrification measure. So it, it, it is, it's all over the board. It's different uh, everywhere we go. And I think that is one of the most important points that beneficial electrification is really a concept that has been driven by these goals of, and I, I'm not being able all of that I can think of is you know, decarbonization, greenhouse, greenhouse gas goals, by clean energy goals, by there's a, a, a lot of concepts that are um, all these organizations support. And what that is doing is driving the technologies and the programs that Brian was talking about in our industry that are now becoming a part of um, the utility goals and the uh, even you know building operators and, and that type of thing goals is that would be how I would define it but I'm sure someone else could do a much better job on the panel Does, would anybody like to take that to explain why beneficial electrification goals are happening and where they're coming from and how that fits in yeah I'm not sure I'm gonna do a better job than that but I'll add a little bit of sort of the the utility excels perspective um, I think Brian did a great job hitting the three main points and those, those goals kind of agree with what the state has 
define beneficial electrification as. Um, however, in the, in the state of Colorado, they weren't as um, much of a and, 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 it was more of an or. I think it's a little more of a general definition. And from the utility perspective, um, what we're striving for is much more of an and, right? Because there are, there's electrification and frankly, there's some electrification that we feel is great. And there's some electrification that we feel is probably not very well positioned and not beneficial. Um, and, you know, an example I would give is that if you have an income qualified customer and, you know, they're using natural gas heat, that's very likely the most economical choice for them. And they may not be in a position where they have flexibility to, to increase their energy burden or, you know, have higher ongoing costs. And so in that case, electrification may be great from reducing carbon, but for that customer in that situation, you know, we don't feel it's a, it's a good situation. So um, I think the key for Excel in this is really facilitating customer choice because different customers place different weights on, you know, different priorities, right? Some are very focused on decarbonization and have, extra or, or available funds to support that and others are not others are frankly very focused on meeting their their minimum bills and being able to kind of keep their house warm and, and food on the table and so you know for excel it the, the the beneficial part of electrification has to include customer choice and you know we've kind of started to uh, move towards that and by including opportunities and, and measures in our proposed DSM plan to to really give customers those choices, right? So customers that want to participate can and customers in, in some of those more uh, sensitive economic groups, you know, don't necessarily have to. Great. Um, would anybody else like to comment on that? Because I one thing I'm wondering about is why is beneficial electrification even happening? What is driving this? I think from the perspective of the field, I think we all in this group can talk about what beneficial electrification is doing and what the interest is in it. But maybe we need to step back and explain why it's happening. Um, the and short answer is carbon reduction. Um, you know, I think not to be too sort of Excel centric here, but you know, we two years ago we came out with a very um, focused goal of reducing carbon on our electric grid 30 you know 80 percent by 2030 and 100 by 2050 and you know within a week we had various stakeholders asking well what about the gas side right and we have successfully changed the or, or removed the electric utility as the largest carbon emitter in the nation and as you do that other things keep start popping up and, and focus shifts, right? And the focus is squarely on removing carbon from the built environment. And, and pr the primary source of that right now is the natural gas that is burned by end use customers in their buildings. Anybody else want to comment on that? I'll chime in. That's Mark, I think you're hitting it beautifully and very well said, you know, in those details. Um, one thing I'll add, and then I'll go into maybe a little more philosophical or policy topical conversation, but basically you know, one thing we've always seen in the field um, that's been a concern, especially in older homes, older buildings are still the prevalence of, you know, atmospheric open, you know, natural gas furnaces, boilers, things like that, that still have the ongoing risk of sometimes producing carbon monoxide, sometimes having backdrafting problems that were, you know, releasing nitrogen oxides and other pollutants, you know, into the living, living and working space um, that's there. And so there's that added benefit um, in a time when people are spending more time in homes <laughs> um, and indoor air quality has become a high profile concern for so many people in their homes you know, what we do to electrify and eliminate natural gas combustion um, in buildings is gonna have that added benefit. So I, so I state that. But one thing I know this group has talked about it many times before, um, but when we talk about, you know, people that are, have, are challenged from an income perspective to be able to 
make the shift to an air source heat pump and super insulating their home to justify things like an air source heat pump or even a ground source heat pump retrofits. You know, that is something certainly on a social big picture level that we as the, we as leaders need to keep talking about because um, you know the challenge for so many people to make these changes economically has to find a pathway to be overcome. Um, I know where Excel needs to set rebate levels, you know, by QC and legislative standards, but it's like things need to be done because you know it's you can super insulate and do amazing things with older buildings to make it where an air source heat pump will be or a hybrid system maybe for a period of time, but certainly getting to an air source heat pump can be very cost effective as far as the monthly utility bills. But we have to have the energy efficiency <laughs> built into these existing buildings even to make them far more airtight, far better insulated to do things that aren't just like oh, shaving 20%. It's like, we have to shave them 80% and it can be done. It's just, we haven't as a society said that that is economically important enough to us in the collective to say this needs to happen. So I throw that out there <laughs> as food for fodder. Um, and then to say, you know, the indoor air quality part is just another cool benefit, of course, really big benefit as we move towards electrification in buildings. Well, and I think that's a great, um, those are really good points because um, electrification, one of the things that I heard early on is that, um, you know, why are we even electrifying? Because we're talking about decarbonization and, and, and what's happening in the home, like the weather inside the home, you know, what is the comfort, the indoor air quality, and then there's the savings piece. But if we go back up higher, like I've heard things like, well, now, um, renewables, wind and solar is less expensive than gas. So this is no longer an environmental issue from the perspective of why is this happening? So it's no longer an environmental goal to decarbonize just because it's the right thing to do. There's actual financial metrics underneath it now um, that it's less expensive that, and so it's now changing how the grid has to operate for um, utilities to take that on and that if we talk a little bit about that in terms of uh, is that driving beneficial electrification or one of the original drivers take a shot and I'm, I'm going to say that it's not driving beneficial electrification um, I think that the question of sort of marginal cost of additional generation resources or additional, you know, every kilowatt hour you generate, um, that is a, a very complicated question. Um, you know, and I think to put it into very simple terms, there's on a, a bulk energy system, when you have a relatively low percentage of renewables and you're adding renewables, then yeah, we have been incredibly successful adding very low cost renewables that you know, are in many cases that KWH that you produce from a new wind farm is cheaper than the KWH you would produce from a, a new combined cycle natural gas plant. However, as the, the balance of renewables, non-dispatchable renewables versus dispatchable, historically carbon-based coal natural gas resources, as that balance shifts and you get more and more renewables on the, the grid, um, the, the, the economics change. And I don't think that anybody really has the exact answer of how that's going to look with, you know, 70, 80, 90% penetration of, of renewables um, because they are non-dispatchable. And so part of the theory or the thinking is the more that, that we can influence um, consumption, the, the demand side of that, right? You have supply of electricity and demand for electricity. And as we lose control, dispatchability of the supply side, the more flexibility you have on the demand side, um, the, the, the easier it'll be to facilitate that transition to renewables. And so, you know, there's, and there's a lot of 
there's a lot of opportunities for flexibility, right? EVs, electric vehicles is one. Yep, tons of new electric load. And for the most part, it's pretty controlled, right? But if we bring all of those new electric vehicles on and everybody charges them when they all get home from work, if, if we ever go back to work in the office, that is, when they all get home from work at, you know, six o'clock, five o'clock, and they turn their ovens on to cook dinner at the same time, and in the summer, their air conditioners kick on, um, there's going to be an immense build out needed on the grid and renewables, you know, aren't going to be available in sufficient quantities right at that time. So we have to manage when that load comes on. And I think electrification is um, a similar opportunity for us, especially if we think about the heating side, where currently the vast majority of at least our, you know, the, the, the grid in our eight states, um, the vast majority of that does not peak in winter, right? We have a few pockets at a distribution level that do. Um, and so there's an opportunity to add load, you know, and better, more fully utilize the existing distribution transmission infrastructure and to more, you know, better utilize those non-dispatchable renewables by using those to heat homes and businesses rather than, and, and frankly, water as well, um, you know, make hot water instead of using natural gas. Now, if that shift, if everybody shifts to heating their homes with electricity and given current technology, really cold days, heat pumps get less efficient, some may even kick back to electric resistance, we're gonna basically flip our summer peaking utility to a winter peaking utility. And not only will we flip it, the magnitude is gonna be much larger. Um, the average you know, building and, and home in our service territory requires much more energy to heat it on a, from a peak load standpoint than it does to cool it. And so, you know, this transition we see, it's, it's really a combination of things that have to happen together, right? The shift to additional renewables has to happen. It can't be all wind. There has to be some wind, some solar. You know, there has to be some level of battery storage in there. There has to be some other level of storage because frankly, batteries aren't going to do it all. And so as I think Marcus was talking about earlier, Thermal storage in a building is huge. You know, if we can preheat a building or pre-cool a building and let it coast through certain periods, same thing with our water heaters. Um, you know, there are smart water heaters in the market right now that literally can store, they can, they can use all the energy they need in a one to two hour period and effectively coast throughout the day. And so we can use those as very controllable load to use renewables when there's a ton of renewables on the system. It's very cheap and then coast through the periods where there aren't renewables. And so, you know, everything we're talking about with electrification, with controls, with energy efficiency to, uh, as Paul was talking about, reduce the overall need for heating and cooling in the built environment. You know, EVs have a, a place, it all has to work together kind of in concert. And frankly, I don't think anybody knows exactly what that right mix will be, but we know where we're headed. And as we kind of make these incremental steps, you know, we'll figure out uh, like, hey, we need more of this, or maybe we need a little less of this and slow down on that and wait for other parts to catch up. So it's, you know, I, I don't know that I, I think I got a little bit off topic on your initial question, but it's, it's all one big mix. And, you know, they're, the cheap renewables is not the answer because they're not always available. And so we have to bring all these other pieces in together in concert with renewables. Now that is fantastic in framing up um, what is going to be happening that is driving what we're calling beneficial electrification. Um, and then what is the goal by 2030 for Excel? Um, that's also one of the major goals driving what's happening. So our goal on the electric side is to reduce carbon emissions from our electric uh, system by 80% from a, a 2005 baseline. And so you know, that encompasses, we, we've, there's been a lot of renewables that have added to the system, but also there's been a lot of new load on the system. And so, you know, kind of the total electric production keeps going up. Our baseline is still the same. And so we have to get rid of 80% of the carbon from that 2005 baseline by 2030. And, you know, we're, we're on track to do it. Um, it's, it's really that last 20% between 2030 and 2050, where there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of, there's going to need to be new solutions, new ideas, new concepts, new ways of working, but we have, we have a little longer to do that one. 
<laughs> Great. And um, Marcus, do you want to talk about some of the other technologies? Because their utilities and the grid are a, a, a large piece that's driving this, but then there's a lot of other things going on in the marketplace um, that NREL is working on. I think, um, well, first of all, I mean, I find this discussion quite interesting and, and somewhat puzzling um, because um, um, there is, and Mark uh, mentioned that uh, there's this, uh, the fact that we have uh, dispatchability yeah, issues as we start uh, getting like high levels of uh, renewable energy uh, generation taking place. Um, when you have like this mismatch necessarily when you actually cannot, you know, at will increase the sun or increase the wind or, or anything like that. Um, there's a component of storage that is necessary to actually try to, uh, to take advantage at the high times of generation and then use it at the low times of generation, right? So when the generation is lower, um, energy efficiency, you know, becomes like a key to actually size those systems properly. Um, we cannot do storage at will um, because there's a cost involved, right? So there's a mix of um, electrochemical storage, the, the batteries that we know. Um, and yes, uh, Mark mentioned the uh, EVs, uh, electric vehicles could be part of this puzzle. Um, but, you know, we are like looking at big uh, storage facilities that could be used. This has to be a shared resource. Um, and so we need to think about the uh, demand side to make sure that you know the materials that we use and all the energy that actually goes into those materials is reasonable right so energy efficiency becomes like a critical part to size and use those materials properly right because otherwise it's not like you know you have infinite amount of money to put like a, a big big battery um, in a partic particular district um, i'm kind of uh, you know very i, I remember this uh, vividly when, uh, you know, 10, uh, 12 years ago, NREL started thinking about the, uh, the uh, um, uh, energy uh, systems integration facilities, if, which is essentially to answer those questions, right? So we try to uh, connect buildings to the grid, both uh, in real time and, and actually in the hardware in the loop kind of ways to answer questions such as, you know, what happens if you, the renewables go up? 10%, 20%, 30%, and so on and so forth. Um, we, we certainly don't have all the answers, but we can actually simulate um, and uh, with real systems are connected. But my point is, in going back is that the energy efficiency question that somebody asked, like, what do we need energy efficiency is because in order to size things, you know, properly and actually get enough materials and money involved, um, we need to particularly look at electrochemical storage and thermal storage um, in, in a reasonable way. Energy efficiency is used to actually reduce the demand so we can actually juggle those, those costs necessarily. And not only costs to uh, the end user, but to society as a whole. We have so much materials, and you know, lithium is an example, and other materials may be very important to be part of this, uh, this puzzle. So, um, you know, there, there are many avoided costs that can be uh, that can be reached by 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 investing in energy efficiency, and I'm not even talking about the benefits inside, right? I mean, in the absence of like let's say proper insulation and walls, you may have an effect. Well, you may provide enough, but you have an uncomfortable building many times because the temperatures that surround you are like lower, let's say, in the winter time, even though you are providing the heat uh, flux necessarily to keep the house, let's say, comfortable inside you still perceive the cold temperatures outside. So um, all of that needs to be taken into account, not to mention the durability of buildings when you start having condensation on walls that are cold. So there are many reasons for doing that that are not only related to energy. Those are excellent points and, and pulls together a whole nother piece. Um, I, I can use a simple example in working with builders is that um, you, know, you can spend for putting solar, put some PV on the house, Paul, you could talk to this as well, um, that you know, a builder would, without doing energy efficiency and sealing up the envelope, and tightening up the envelope on the house, they would be spending $16,000 on solar with many more racks. Whereas if you, you tighten up 
the building in, in you know, for example, in net zero, then you end up spending $8,000 on a much smaller array. I know, Paul, that's exactly what you're talking about um, doing with the buildings in a new program that you're talking about. Um, I know, Paul, if you wanna talk, maybe uh, before we move on, Brian, I wanted to find out if uh, you and I also had an interesting conversation just framing up beneficial electrification energy efficiency that this transition is moving really fast. And we talked earlier about in the 19, you know, 100 years ago, we started utilities, we started selling um, electricity and electric appliances were sold by the utility that we had started in the 40s, right? And then we talked about the 70s. And so I just kind of quick comment. And then now it's one of the fastest transitions that's happening faster with internet of things added to it faster than um, smartphones and the internet. Yes, definitely. I mean, we see what's happening right now is really the fourth wave of electrification and mm -hmm. each wave has proceeded more quickly than the previous, you know, lighting was the first electrification effort, then it was appliances, uh, you know, as we were talking about. Um, and then it was computers coming online and plug loads coming in. And now we're looking back at all of that electrification and saying, well, we're making a lot of environmental impacts associated with this. Now, how can we do it um, more responsibly? How can we electrify um, in, a, in a way that has less impact and that benefits society uh, in, a, in a more broad sense? Excellent. And Paul, I don't know if you want to give us a perspective um, on beneficial electrification and just with the individual buildings and why are people moving and making decisions to spend more money to take these types of um, tasks on in their homes and their commercial buildings? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I'll you know, I'll touch on some projects we've worked on in the last few years, I guess going back as much as four years now, but some multifamily projects that um, made the choice to be, you know, they're built in Brighton by CNA companies with Con Frank with SMC Geothermal being a, uh, a key designer for these projects. And we were involved in making sure the envelope was at least meeting Energy Star uh, certification in you know, these projects. And some, some, I don't know, some big picture elements to this. Uh, the biggest driving force for this, you know, I'm going back four years, which seems like a long time ago and how building electrification has accelerated, but where they were at with this is that they saw that by really scrutinizing load calculations, <laughs> so to get nerdy, some of us here will understand all this stuff, but, um, you know, Khan in particular, and we helped him a bit with this, looked very carefully at all the padding, all the oversizing that has gone into the manual JDS calculations that have been around now for 30 plus years. And you know, the designer of those calculations has admitted, admitted to me 15 years ago, it's like, these things are grossly oversized. <laughs> we should rework these calculation tools. But not to get too lost in that weed, but it's like, it was really important that when you looked at what was being sized for the equipment, if you did it by the calculations, it made it where things were much too expensive to do a ground source heat pump system. And that's what they ended up doing with this by being brave enough to look at the calculations, scrutinize those, squeeze out about 30% of the fat in the calculations, but then doing Energy Star, really beyond Energy Star quality, skim coat of foam, on you know exterior walls, then having blown in fiberglass, actually they did blown in cellulose with those. That's right. Um, you know, in the walls, making sure air tightness was very very good. Um, in thermal, you know, properties very good. The windows were not amazing windows. They were like you know a U value of 0 0.30 um, windows, which were very good, but not amazing windows. But making the envelope work so the ground source heat pump sizing could be really reduced and making that far more cost effective to install was a big part. Also, <laughs> the developer took advantage of something that's been around since 1995, 
no, excuse me, 2005, I'm dating that too much, 2005 with the Energy Policy Act that was passed federally to get a $2,000 tax credit per unit on those. So this developer walked away with like $324,000 of tax credits while being smart about how they sized ground source heat pumps and putting together a high quality envelope to make things work. So they were 50, at least 50%, not all the units, but the vast majority of the units were at least 50% more efficient than the 2005 energy code. And that's in heating and cooling properties. And that's where that tax credit has <laughs> been renewed, you know, intermittently by Congress and by you know, presidents in office to have that continue. If that simple, if that simple piece of legislation were extended out where it was not always retroactive, like the way they've been doing it, but if they would say, oh, for now, starting now for the next five years, if you have a permit hold to build a property that can meet the standard, you know, meet or exceed the standard, we'd have builders and developers clamoring to do electrification and new construction. I mean, the ones I talked to, they're like, if we could just know that that would be there as that as our carrot, instead of it being taken away, sometimes there, sometimes not. So anyway, going into those weeds, but that was a very big part of it. You know, what I'm, you know, and the multifamily area to me in the front range of Colorado and many parts of the country is such a critical part of new construction right now that proud to be a part of that project where they did that with ground source heat pumps. They built two different developments um, you know, with that. One was 264 units, if I remember right. The other one was over 300 units, um, you know, meant to serve for people that were, you know, working jobs like working in restaurants, which I hope people get to go back and do again <laughs> you know, soon, but, um, you know, provide housing in that area, make it super affordable. Oh, the last thing I should mention is that they've been monitoring a 1200 square foot two bedroom unit in one of those buildings, the heating and cooling costs, not lighting and appliances, but the heating and cooling costs are averaging $7.68 a month. If I remember that right, it's like $7.62 or $7.68 a month. I mean, that's insanely low, <laughs> um, but it's the super insulation, super, you know, well, great insulation, great air tightness, not passive house, but really good. And then the ground source heat pump that was properly sized that's Killing it, you know, on that side of things. So it, it makes sense, but it's building as a system that makes it happen. So enough said. Perfect phrase at the end, building as a system. And I think that everyone here understands that there's the existing equipment that we've been putting into these buildings and how that's now changing with all of these definitions and these forces that are happening in the marketplace. And before I move on, does anybody else want to comment about the energy efficiency and the beneficial electrification that can play in the role? I think we've had some really great comments on that so far. You know, I think one sort of comment to put this in perspective, um, and, and this is one metric, it's, you know, just food for thought. If you look at the, the spending by most utilities on DSM programs, right? And I'll, I'll talk about our, our DSM plan that we just filed for 21 and 22. You know, the ballpark between electric and gas DSM, so not even DR, it, it's in the ballpark of $100 million. And of that, you know, beneficial education is getting a ton of headlines, a ton of news, but it's about a million dollars of that, right? And so, it's a tiny, tiny piece. It's a very exciting piece. It's a, you know, somewhat sexy piece, whatever you want to call it, but it's still, it, it's got a long ways to, to go and there. And, and we rely on that fundamental energy efficiency and demand response is, is really the lion's share of the plan. And, you know, that'll, that'll shift over time, but even, you know, if, if, if beneficial education is wildly successful and it, it grows tenfold, you know, in the next few years. And that's, I think that's wildly successful beyond anybody's, you know, expectations. Um, it's still 10% of the plan, right? It's still, so there, there's a ton of energy efficiency that, that has to happen. And for all the good reasons we just talked about, but just, I, I kind of wanted to throw out the scale of things to, you know, to keep it a little bit in perspective. Absolutely. And you actually went exactly where I wanted to go next and ask you and Anne, um, since we've just gone through the settlement and, and that brings up 
the changes that are happening, we could look at the actual equipment and the, um, we say beneficial electrification. What is the equipment that's changing that's going to be put into these homes? And Paul was talking about geothermal heat pumps. That's a perfect example. And I think yeah, maybe you could um, talk about the incentives specifically that are coming with beneficial electrification. Yeah, and I, if you don't mind, Ann, I'll take like a minute to intro, but then you've got all the much, much better knowledge on all the details and whatnot. But at a high level, there's not a lot of new equipment um, because a lot of the equipment has already been in, in our plans and been able for rebates, right? Whether it's, we've had ground source heat pumps for years, air source heat pumps, mini split heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, it's all been there. Um, what's changing is really the, some of the target customers that we can go after and that we can, instead of just incentivizing customers that already had electric heat to put in much more efficient electric heat, we can start to look at and incentivize customers to shift from gas to electric. And so with that, Andy, you wanna kind of go into some of the details and elaborate a little more? Sure. Um, so we expect to have higher rebates than we have in the past uh, as a result of settlement for some of those technologies we've already had, but framing them up differently and uh, really starting to identify the customers that are most likely to take advantage of it as let's call them what they are, early adopters. Mm -hmm. And so part of, part of what we need to do is look at who's most likely to take advantage of those technologies early, because we know not everybody in the market is going to change their approach to their business overnight, and we wouldn't expect them to. It's, it's a gradual process. We learned a lot, you know, part of the reason why, yes, this is happening quickly. We've learned a lot about how adoption happens uh, as a result. Thinking back a few years, sorry, I'm gonna go down my in the weeds moment of, of looking at history. Right? We had a handful of companies that embraced the idea of high efficiency air conditioners with quality installation. And then we leveraged their success stories and to help broaden that out to others. Not all customers was it appropriate for, but certainly they, you know, the industry learned to identify who was most likely to take advantage as an early adopter. And then there's a comfort level that comes with it too. I will tell you that at this point in terms of understanding what it looks like for, um, for the total sales process. I have, go to a customer's house, I'm really down in the weeds, aren't I? But it, you know, as a contractor, if I were to go to a customer's house, what I'm likely to do today is say, oh, so it's the middle of winter and your furnace stopped, I am most likely to say business as usual, right? Let's talk about a furnace. For some customers, that's going to be all that, that they want to hear about or are willing to hear about. But there may be some triggers for us to talk to them about air source heat pump or many split heat pump, um, uh, electric heat pump, water heater, in addition. And there are some clues as to who those early adopters are going to be. And that would be, for example, if they have chosen solar or wind as their generation. Um, source, which is something, you know, it's a new question for contractors to ask. It may be uh, that they have a solar panel. Um, it may be that they have an electric vehicle. Things that would indicate that for them, it's not about just the price tag up front or even the unknown kind of characteristics at this point, we're still learning what the return on investment is gonna look like year by year in uh, the front range area um, we're still gathering information about that. So the ones who are making decisions, who have already made decisions that may be uh, more emotional than they are uh, dollar driven, I think will really help us kind of hone in on those early participants and help contractors figure out who they should give bids to um, for those technologies first. Uh, we don't expect that's gonna be an overnight change. Now, I'd love to talk about training, but I'll hold back. So think we, we are expecting to have a cold climate heat pump. Um, we'll have higher rebates on heat pumps than we've had in the past. Um, we have a new level for electric heat pump water heaters. We'll have those as well. 
Um, there's also some things we expect to see on the um, commercial industrial side. I think you mentioned one of them having to do with uh, building uh, heat pumps for buildings. And um, there are others as well. There may be new hardware to facilitate um, beneficial electrification like a boiler, providing water heating um, with control. So demand or which fuel is being used at different times of the day. So that if we're curtailing renewables on the generation side, the cost would be low to preheat or pre-cool buildings. So all of that, you know, there's so much that fits together. If I can, I want to reframe for a minute the, you know, when we talk about our clean energy future, Excel Energy really wants to invest uh, uh, in the, um, we all want to invest, right, in that, in clean energy future uh, generation sources and what's happening in the homes, which means, you know, going back to very simple uh, kind of concept is we're going to focus on changing heating homes. Uh, from, you know, I'm residential focused, right? Heating homes, heating buildings um, with electricity first and then using backup as needed. I don't know if that helps. I'm gonna stop. Patricia, you wanna get me back on track here? No, I think everything that you're talking about is really important about the interplay of what this looks like and how the market's going to transform. And um, I'm wondering if maybe you and Paul could talk a little bit more about that interplay of, um, like we say in the next two years, five years, 10 years, like what equipment and services will be installed. And I hear about the scenario of, you know, you end up having an air source heat pump and um, which also uh, includes, you know, the, the cooling and the heating um, that now that's becoming cost neutral just over the mark in this like last year um, in Colorado because we have a colder climate. Um, but then, you know, if you had a battery in your house and then you have some renewables, you've got some um, solar on your house and the discussion of, you know, and you've got a smart energy management devices and you're looking at your own energy in your house. Like this is all the equipment that I'm hearing about. And how do we understand that as a homeowner, I'm gonna have different mechanicals and I'm gonna get better results on my indoor weather in my house, right? Of, of my air quality and my comfort and my savings on my bill. Um, but all that is needed partially for Excel as well to help manage and shift and move load. And that's my base understanding. And I'm wondering, um, you know, the experience of the homeowner, if we could talk about that more so that the contractors will say, well, I don't need to, I don't want to start installing heat pumps. I'm too busy anyway. Well, where is that? What's the, what's it going to look like for all of our businesses? What's being installed in these homes? And I feel like everybody here on the panel can probably talk about different aspects of it because you have a hand in what that's going to look like. I don't know who would like to start. Well, I'll chime in with some context. You know, in the 20, you know, six, seven years now I've been involved in this. One of the key things I think has been done in small ways, but it has been long needed to help homeowners is more collaboration between smaller companies that, well, the companies that are doing the air sealing and insulation communicating with the companies that are doing the windows, communi communicating with the companies, collaborating, communicating with the companies that do the HVAC systems, and then communicating, collaborating with the ones doing solar and storage now to help present to homeowners a unified package you know, for people. It's been challenging for homeowners and you know, people like me that were doing audits and the like, we, sought to be that and Excel and other utilities have done great programs to have home advisors to help kind of pull that together. But if companies would start collaborating and seeing that they're doing home, you know, houses of system solutions more comprehensively, a little bit less of like, well, I do this part and you figure out how to do the rest of this. 
that would help homeowners tremendously. You know, it's, it's getting, you know, helping them be with someone that's a full scale auto mechanic <laughs> for their home, you know, type of thing. It's like, you don't go to an auto mechanic and expect that's like, well, I can't get tires, can I? Or I can't get, you know, electrical stuff taken care of with my car. You know, it's like, we've had that forever, you know, with cars, we've not still quite gotten there with homes. So it's like, it's that umbrella option, you know, things that have been worked on by, by various companies, but that would come together would make things so much better for the homeowner because some homes desperately need more and more insulation, more and more air sealing, you know, better windows, and then eventually moving on to, you know, things that would have to do with mechanical systems and solar and the like. Some are very ready, you know, to have solar and, you know, solar storage. And some of the homeowners know, but a lot of the homeowners are like, help, <laughs> I don't know where I'm at, you know, you know, where do I start, where do I begin? So that's one thing I throw out for everyone that's listening here from the EBC. It's like, guys, men, women, talk with each other and put together plans to help solve, you know, package, you know, package your solutions for homeowners and for building owners, honestly, smaller building owners um, and smaller apartment building owners that don't have engineers on staff, they need, <laughs> they need help from people working together to help give them one stop shop type of information. So I'll say that. Great. I'd like to add on to what Paul said. I've done a lot of research into behind the meter batteries for both non-residential and residential customers. And one area where I think both utilities and contractors could play a bigger role is in helping educate the customer about what the real benefits are going to be for these systems. Because I see a lot of customers installing batteries because the vendor told them they're gonna save money and there's, it's not even possible for them to save money with the system, like physically impossible, even with a fully optimized system. So for most part, residential batteries are a resiliency play. It's for backup power. That's the main value proposition for them right now, given the costs. And this is all the rates across the board. It, it doesn't matter if you have really high rates or really low rates, the, the batteries for residential customers are probably ne never going to save them money. And so... You need to be honest about that. What do the what do the customer actually care about? Do they want backup power? Make sure they have a backup circuit in place because if they don't have a backup circuit in place, emergency circuit, they're not going to be able to use it for backup power for very long. Um, and help them understand, you know, do they really value increasing their self generation, their consumption of their solar self generation enough to warrant putting a battery in? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. So that's what Anne was talking about. Those those near market early adopters, how much they really value that emotional uh, feeling and, and the energy independence that they get from knowing they have a battery in the garage because they're gonna have to value it pretty highly because <laughs> uh, it's not really an economically rational decision. To talk about that, I, I, we have a, a whole project on the behind the meter uh, storage and many of you may, may know about it. Um, and we have like, you know, thermal energy storage and batteries and trying to make the decision about like how much of each and so on. But I agree, I think we need to, uh, to, uh, to sell the proper uh, value uh, when we talk about batteries because it's not an energy savings play it, or even cost savings necessarily. If anything, it's an expensive ordeal, um, but it's a necessary one to, uh, to sell resilience, right? So the, the system will provide when necessary. Very difficult to sell that. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's difficult to sell comfort. It's difficult to sell like small amounts of like uh, at bill savings, right? I mean, my, and my Excel bill was a hundred bucks. I mean, like I, I, I wish I could actually lower it more, but you know, I'm not gonna spend a couple thousand dollars or, or even more to try to, to lower that because the, the, the math is not there. When the, they came to, um, to replace the furnace, uh, so I needed a furnace replacement two years ago and I said, oh, I'm gonna go all gung-ho on, on the heat pump. You know, I, I'm, I'm very much into the thermodynamics of this. I love the COP being high, I love all of that. Um, when a guy told me how much that was gonna cost as opposed to a very high efficiency uh, furnace, you know, like I, I look at my wife and say, like, I don't think we're gonna do this as much as I love the heat pumps. So it's not an easy sell and we need to, uh, and whenever talking to customers, we need to be pretty realistic 
and uh, and obviously our you know uh, the the contractors, the sales force, and the workforce as a whole, and the and mentioned workforce um, is not necessarily prepared to have those discussions, which which actually may be very frustrating because you may hear things, including I did, um, that are not true. Um, and so how, how do you balance that? And I think it's important to talk about that. Great point. Um, any other comments? It is important for us to help, um, help the, the, the contractors who are talking with our customers and start painting the picture of the energy future. Even though we don't know all the elements now, we can look back at the previous 10 years and all the things that have changed um, technologically, um, not necessarily in energy, but in other parts of our life to kind of help frame up how different is our inner is is your energy source going to look? Um, how much is it going to cost? What are the implications? Because they're they're buying systems now; they're going to last for at least twenty years. That's year twenty forty. I mean, it's just it, it's part of what I'm feeling is an urgency to get going on this because we have to start building the base so that then it expands. We know it's not going to happen overnight, but we've got to get started because. Once you've invested in that new system, how likely are you to replace early? That's pretty tough. So just wanted to give that plug. No. Patricia, we have some questions here. Um, not sure if I know we're kind of coming up on time in a little bit. Do you want me to ask a few to the different panels? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so this is for Paul. It's coming from, from David. To accelerate beneficial electrification in the new home construction market, how would you characterize and prioritize converting the builders and developers to beneficial electric thinking? Thanks, you know, thanks for that question. And it may go back to uh, one of my earlier comments that um, having the builders work with their engineers, um, especially on loads, <laughs> Um, and really, you know, really put sharpen a pencil on that and look very carefully at what we've trusted for so long out of, you know, standard computerized um, manual J modeling, you know, when it comes to residential and multifamily um, sizing of heating and cooling equipment and following a path like Con Frank, I'm doing plugs for him, but the guy, I think he's great in his creativity and his forward thinking with SMC engineer or geothermal, you would be like, find the way that you'll find your path to ground source heat pumps being something that's economically viable. In new construction, we should be doing that all the time, honestly, um, anywhere here in the front range that I've seen the economics now be borne out that it makes all kinds of sense in multifamily. It makes sense in single family to be looking at it. So it's, something that we've had a, a skewed perspective on the economics in the building community and we need to start with how we size this equipment to see how it ends up being cost effective to do and push on congress to get <laughs> um, an extension i'd hope for a five-year extension on the 2005 energy policy act for the two thousand dollar credit you know per unit to be 50 percent more efficient than the 2005 code if they simply would do that like i said Builders would be looking at ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, higher levels of insulation, um, you know, much more readily and looking at building as a system. Great. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, so another question is, um, and, and anyone chime in here, this is a lot, of, there is a lot of discussion about beneficial electrification of downtown buildings, especially the city and county of Denver buildings. Many are heated with either steam or natural gas boilers. It is very difficult to convert these to heat pump technologies given the temperatures needed by uh, these building systems. The only choice would be electric resistance or electric boilers, which seem to create a huge demand peak in the winter. Is electrification really feasible for existing large buildings? I'm gonna go out on a limb. Smiling. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go out on a limb and and you know the not sure who asked that, but it's a great question and it's incredibly challenging 
situation. Not only are you talking about a densely built environment, um, you're talking about one that has, you know, hundred year old buildings all the way up to brand new, you know, and skyscrapers that are, are literally going up um, high, high, um, you know, residential, high, uh, high density residential. So, and you're also talking about an area that has currently three um, energy distribution systems in it. It has steam, it has natural gas, it has electricity. And frankly, all of them due to the growth are constrained. And so there is no easy answer for downtown Denver. Uh, and actually, I'm sorry, there's four energy distribution systems. There's steam, natural gas, electricity, and there's a district cooling system. Um, that situation is, um, for those of you who have been following, right, there's been a, a steam, there's a steam rate case a couple years ago. Um, even if you left the electrification out of it, there, there's a lot going on there. Um, I, you know, as part of that steam settlement, there was a, um, a requirement to go in and do more of a, a holistic plan for that area. And so, I can't comment too far on how that's going other than lots of, you know, lots of different opinions there. Um, I think some of the, I think the city and county has been very clear on their goals, their aspirations for carbon reduction and for electrification, not only for their own buildings, but for their constituents. Um, you know, but I think also the, some of the operators of those buildings from, uh, for the city and county of Denver have a very realistic, um, you know, need and look, and they're they're trying to figure out how it would actually work. Because in addition to building heat, there are even some of those um, buildings, the, the art museum for one, that you know uses steam to humidify their the the exhibits. And so, it's not an easy question. Um, I think it's it's an opportunity. And you know, to Anne's point, the decisions we make um, as customers, as a utility, as a government especially in that microcosm are, they're gonna last many, many years, right? And, you know, do any of us really want to invest um, a lot of money in either a, a, a carbon powered steam system upgrades or natural gas upgrades in that area? Um, I don't think, you know, frankly, there's, you know, I don't think that's, that's anyone's long-term desire, um, but there are some constraints and, you know, that electric grid is already and that system is already constrained. And I think you're right. There are space constraints around individual buildings. There are, you know, temperature requirements for some of those. A lot of those buildings are, you know, direct steam. You know, you're not just going to get by circulating hot water in them. So I don't have a great answer. If anybody does, I would love to talk to you because it's something that, you know, is a, it's, it's probably one of the tougher problems we have that, you know, as far as what to do with it. So. I think from that, my question is kind of looking towards Marcus and Paul. Um, do you have examples of high-rise buildings that that are that they wouldn't be retrofit, right? They'd be new. That can get numbers that are needed. Mark's talking about. Oh. I'll jump in briefly, and probably many people are aware of this even more so than I, but. You know, I've certainly read um, about many um, high-rise buildings in Manhattan being retrofit to achieve, you know, passive house uh, performance standards. So, again, you know, fuel oil is more dominant in New York, as I understand it still, um, the natural gas being present, and their electricity rates are certainly higher there than what we have um, here is my understanding, even you know, in commercial projects. So it's certainly being done in the United States. It's certainly being done in other parts of the world. Um, I think that's part of what we here should be doing in Colorado is looking, you know, looking at what's been done in other parts of the country with those types of buildings and seek to learn as best we can. And so I wanted to just jump in on one of the, the panelists, Mike asked if about the, the point I made earlier about EV electric vehicles and, and staggered charging. And um, the short answer is yes, we actually already do have some pilots in the market, some programs um, to do various things with charging, right? Some are overnight, 
um, and more um, what I would call set and forget and others are a more interactive um, working with you know vehicle manufacturers to adjust dynamically um, when vehicles charge and yeah you know that and, and I probably should have finished that analogy around EVs are a little further ahead than, than beneficial electrification for buildings and we are absolutely you know we're probably two years into figuring out how to manage that load as it comes on the grid so that it doesn't need a whole bunch of, of extra build out of the electric side. And I, I would envision that building electrification and, and water, domestic water heating electrification would follow similar patterns is that we can't do it all at once. We have to do it in a managed, thoughtful way. Otherwise we're gonna have huge, huge grid impacts. So thanks for, for the follow-up, Mike.